You are listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net. So we're moving into this fall season with, um, with a, a short series called Rooted. A lot of people ask the question like about programming and stuff at the Foundry Church. And one of the realities is, is we have this thing, we call it our weekly rhythm, that we believe is the best path for discipleship and connectivity within the church. And it's not programmed. It is um, one of the callings. If you're a member of this church, you're kind of, we're calling you to live into it. It's weekly worship, which is our gathering here. But then you also have this thing called devotion. And if you're new to the church, like, what's a devotion? We'll talk about that. And then um, there's the sermon-based small groups, which we want everybody in the church part of a sermon-based small group. We're not asking you to volunteer and do a ton of things. We'd love to have you help out once a month or something with different things. But really, we know we get maybe two hours of your week. Two hours. So we're asking spend one of them here in worship with us and spend another one of them in a sermon-based small group. And, and we recognize that weekly rhythm of devotions, of worship, of sermon-based small group, of relational connectivity and different things is so vital. And um, what we're going to do today is we're going we're gonna to talk about um, this first aspect of being rooted, and we're going to use Psalm 1 through the this, this series, this short series we're doing. And um, today I, I wanna talk with you about the idea of, of walking with me. Have you ever had somebody say to you, walk with me? And you take off walking, anybody ever have that? Maybe I just got in trouble and the principal said, Eric, walk with me. You know, like that, that was the way I remember it. But, um, but you would have this, this line, walk with me, and you go and you walk and you're, you're in conversation. But we recognize in our own lives that, um, well, quite often the people who taught us to take those first steps are the people we most walk like. Have you ever noticed that? Have you ever been walking and you realize you're moving just like your dad? And you're like, no. I refuse. Or you're doing something, ladies, you're walking along, and you like do something like, oh, my mom just came out, right? And you think, no, this can't be happening. I remember as a little boy in Grand Junction, Colorado, we were at this place called Starvin' Arvin's Big Biscuit. It's as awesome as it sounds. And um, it's a place for biscuits and gravy. And there was this older cowboy sitting there, cowboy hat, and he's sitting there with his jeans, his work shirt, and his boots, and there's a little guy across the table from him, probably five to six years old, and he's sitting there, jeans, boots, hat, took their hats off, said grace, ate their biscuits and gravy, you know, heart healthy, and, um, and they, they get done with the meal, and granddad kind of stands up, and he goes, oh, guess what the little guy did? Oh. Is it hurt being, you know, six made of rubber bands, you know? And granddad kind of walked off with this kind of awesome, like you could tell he did bareback, you know, bronc riding in the rodeos. He just kind of walked off like this. And what did the little guy do? Yeah, here we go. (laughs) Off he goes. He had this little swagger to him because what was he doing? He was walking like the person he walked with. He was walking with someone and he adopted his movements, his motions, because he valued that person. That person's movements took on their own manifestation in his life. And walking with people, we eventually begin to move like them. And so today, we're going to talk through Psalm 1. Now, what is the psalm? The Psalms is a book right in the middle of the Bible, and it's, it's the largest book in the Bible, and it's really the worship hymnal, the, the song book, the prayer book for the people of Israel. A lot of them were written by David, a lot of them by um, Moses. There's a number of different authors of the Psalms, but uh, quite often they're worship or prayers, prayers of confession, a good prayer of confession, Psalm 51. A prayer of divine trust is Psalm 91. But you look at Psalm 1 and Psalm 2, and they're really the gatekeepers of the book of Psalms. They're the gatekeepers of it. And Psalm 1 is this interesting uh, kind of declaration of character. And I want to I wanna look at that with you and, and just say, we're going to study this. We're going to look at it in chunks over the next few, next few weeks and try to understand what God's saying through his living word and what it means to us. So let's do this. We're going to pull Psalm 1 up on the screen, and we're going to talk about it, and we're going to listen to it, and maybe just um, grab on. It says this, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or take the path that sinners take or stand 
or sit in the company of mockers, but their delight is in the law of the Lord. And on that law, they meditate day and night. That person who meditates, they are like a tree planted by streams of living water, and they give their fruit in season, and their leaves never wither. Whatever they do prospers, but not so the wicked. They are like chaff. They are like the thing that that husk around the the wheat kernel that when the kernel comes out, it's just real thin and and frail. They're like chaff. And when the wind blows, it blows them away. That is why the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor the unrighteous sinners in the assembly of the righteous. But the Lord, he watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked always leads to destruction. That's Psalm 1. And we're going to keep unpacking it as the weeks go on. Psalm 1 tells us something, that we should be walking with someone. We are inclined to walk with someone. Remember the opening words to this. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked. We walk with people, and we understand the question must be answered, who are you walking with? Who are you and I choosing to walk with and spend time with as we move ahead in this life? What will we spend our time with? What will have influence over your life and over my life as we move forward? Who are we walking with? Here's the thing. Quite often, we walk with the world. We walk with the world and we understand that when it comes to walking with the world, there's generally a negative influence that comes from that. There's this negative sense of, um, of, of just being subtly guided, but there's also just some straight up bad advice that comes from the world at times and we rec- recognize that. But we also know that sometimes the world just tells us the thing we most wanna hear. Uh, scripture would say it tickles our ears. It's the thing we wanna hear. It's the thing that validates or maybe justifies the sin we're living in and we find ourselves getting some bad advice and getting some really um, pleasing sounds that sound good in the moment but lead to destruction of our own lives and our own choices in the end. Psalm 1 says it this way, don't walk in the way of the wicked. Now, when you say when I say wicked, I bet you, like me, picture some hook-nosed, green-skinned lady who has flying monkeys and she's after Dorothy. Anybody else? Okay, apparently people don't think of witches. Um, I, I do. When I think wicked, I either think of the playbill for Broadway or I think of the Wicked Witch of the East. Like that, that is my image of wicked, but it's a little more nuanced than that. It's a little more, well, think of it this way. When we talk wicked, what we're talking about is someone who's ungodly, someone who is apart from God. They're those who don't acknowledge God as Lord. Think about that people who do not acknowledge God as Lord want to have influence over our lives. Those of us who are called according to the purposes of God. So you can see why someone who's apart from God, someone who is not recognizing the Lordship of Jesus Christ, they have no need for his direction. And I love to say it this way, they are unsettled people. People who are apart from God are unsettled. They are fickle and they are restless. Have you ever had it, if you're a parent in this room, have you ever had it with when one of your kids is restless and you're like, sit still. Like you just want them to sit still and they're like, I'm trying, I just can't. It is such a great day to be alive. Anybody <laughs> ever had that? Yeah. And you're just sitting there and sometimes you just pick them up and you're like, I'm just going to squeeze for a minute. Just hold still. And you're you like, like I've done this with Ethan. I picked him up and just kind of hugged him and his legs just and I'm like, oh, Lock him up, you know. You just want him to be still. Those apart from God are restless and they are fickle. They are quick to change their mind. They are quick to change their passion. They are quick to change their purpose. They are altogether unsettled. They are forever on the move, which means they're forever on the hunt, which means something isn't satisfying right where they're at. And when we look at that, we have to understand that they have no certain aim in their life. They have no certain aim in their purpose. They are just led by their lust, whatever they're just, oh, want right now, by their desires. Maybe they have a long-term desire and they're just finding the quickest way there or their whims, right? Their whims. Marketing has mastered playing off our whims. 
We see something, we're like, oh, you know what? Chick-fil-A does sound good. And it may not sound good before, but it plays off your whims. It catches you at the right time. Marketing people do this all the time. They know when certain commercials hit certain audiences and have the best effect. Why? Because they're playing off our whims. The things it's like, oh, when we're most easily steered, when we're most unstructured. These people live unsettled and they're fickle and they're restless and they're just kind of guided by whichever the cult way the cultural winds are blowing. Just think about it with me. Think of the restlessness of our culture. Think of the pace of our culture and its change. How quickly does style change, right? There are things being worn today that I wore in high school. Congrats on that, by the way. Uh, my friends, it didn't work out. And if the mullet comes back, you can plan on that boy getting rocked again because my senior picture was awesome. And, you know, like the mullet, the different things, like you see styles and they change and they pop and we laugh at what used to be and all of a sudden we find somebody else wearing it and it's cool again. The, the pace of it, the pace of the arts, the pace of entertainment, what does it show? It doesn't necessarily show a desire to be creative. It just shows a desire or a lack of desire to stay settled in what really works. Now, I'm not saying there shouldn't be change, but I am saying that you can define the ungodly by their restless nature, their need for more, their need for change, and their need to keep things going. They are fickle. They are restless. Now, let's look at God. Let's take a look and just think about it. God knows the way. God is not fickle. He knows the way, and he knows the way to the path that we should walk down that leads to, well, not only righteousness, but it leads to real life. Have you ever wanted that? Like, like just real life to grab on, and you can feel it, and you can hold close to it. Real life, life in Christ that doesn't feel like it goes away, like the fog in the morning on a hot day that gets burned off, but real life. Why would anyone not want to walk the path that is known, that is purposeful, and is leading somewhere? I can't answer that. I just know this. There are times where I'm quickly steered by my desires, by my whims, and I find myself kind of following that path. Why? Because I too can find myself slowly drifting from God. And when I find that, we have to look at it and say, what, what's the cause? What's the cause going on in us? Well, it's separating ourselves from God. It's choosing something apart from God. So, so let's look at what it means to, to take this in a little more. This Psalm 1, let's, let's talk about for a minute what it means to actually meditate. Now, when I say meditate, somebody's like, oh, sweet, I'm wearing yoga pants. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about yoga. I'm not talking about these things. I'm talking about the Hebrew practice of meditation, the biblical and Christian practice of med meditation. It says this in Psalm 1, blessed is the one who doesn't walk in the path of the wicked, stand in the path of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers, but their delight is in the law of the Lord, and they meditate on it day and night. This word is actually um, pretty awesome. They meditate on the word of the Lord. It is their delight, and day and night their mind is fixed on it. So, so what does it mean to look at this and say, okay, so what is the law? Is it some legal requirement? Is it something? What does it mean to meditate on the law of the Lord? How do we do such a thing? Well, let's understand what we're meditating on. When we say law, we're talking about instruction, direction. It could mean legal things. You know, I mean, think of driving down the road, doing 75 and a 35, and you're what? Meditating on if there's Johnny Law right up around that corner, aren't you? You're like, hmm, is that a cop? You know, you slow down. You meditate on, what is the law? It's instruction. It's direction. It's teaching. It means the instruction or the counsel of God through scripture. That's what we talk about when we mean the law. When we say the law, we're talking about the instruction and the counsel of God by his Holy Spirit through scripture. That's what we're looking at. 
Now, what does it mean to delight in something? That's not a common word anymore. I don't have a good cultural translation to say they delight in it, but like sometimes I just dig something. I really like it, you know? I get into it. I enjoy it. It's desire. It means you delight. You want more of it. It gives you pleasure. It makes you happy. I remember as a young man when uh, we first moved to San Diego, the first time I ever caught a wave. My dad being from California, um, my parents met in college and when they were from Cal Colorado and California, my dad took us to the beach and he taught me how to body surf. I'll never forget the first time I caught a wave. And all of a sudden that thing picked me up and I was like, this is amazing. And then it rolled me up, spit me out and burped me onto the beach like Jonah. And I was like, doing that again and right back out to the water with my little flippers on. I'm like, dad, dad, did you see that? I couldn't get enough of it. I delighted in it. We would leave at 6 a.m. because the surf was right and we'd go down, we would body surf sometimes before school. Why? Because we delighted in it. It was fun. What do you delight in? I think of my own youngest son, Ethan. We were up at Mackinac Island. Erica ran some horrifying turtle race around the island, which that didn't happen for me. And, um, and so she runs this race and we get back to the mainland and, um, and Ethan decides he wants to swim in mid-October in Lake Huron with the Grand Hotel in view. And we're like, all right, do it. Do it if you're into it. That kid stripped to his skivvies and bailed into the water so quick. I was like, that is my son. He loves swimming. He doesn't care. Whenever he can swim, he's in. If the ice is thin enough, he'll just punch a hole and go for it. Why? He loves swimming. He delights in it. He delights in being there. He delights in, in the sound of water and being in it and being soaking wet and playful. I love that idea. What do you delight in? Because it says that the person who loves the law of God, delights in the law of God, will meditate on it day and night. Now, the Hebrew word for meditate is um, what we would call, and I love this word just because of my brain, it's an onomatopoeia, which means it sounds like what it is. So when we say meditate in the Hebrew, it actually is a low kind of groaning or growling sound. Like when you're riding in the car with someone and they talk to themselves and they're like, <laughs> yeah. What just happened in your head, right? That's, the, that's actually what it means. It's a low mutter. It's almost a hum. Kind of like, and it's just real low, just kind of groaning. And what it does, it's like someone reading to themselves or talking to themselves in a low, in a low voice. It means like to chew on something. Eugene Peterson says it this way about scripture. He wrote a book called Eat This Book. Eat it, chew on it, meditate on it. Let it be your low rumbling musings. Let it be the thing that's on your mind when everything else is trying to get in. That's what's on your mind. That's what's always before you. God wants us to always have his word and his desires ever before us, meditating on God's purposes and plans for our lives, his divine instruction and counsel through scripture in our lives. So we can say, how do we know this is true? Deuteronomy 6 verses 4 um, through 9 say it this way. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give today are to be on your heart, desire, right? Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you're sitting down at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them to your forehead. I love that image, by the way. That's supposed to mean like there are Orthodox Jews who put a tiny version of the Torah on their forehead, and it's this thought. Every thought that comes in is what? Filtered first through the law of God. Ooh. I love that. All right, so that's an extra. Um, write, tie them to your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and write them on your gates. When you look at this and you recognize that what God is telling them to do is to always have it ever before them. Why? Because you love it. You delight in it. That is the Shema. That's the Hebrew prayer of the Shema. And the Hebrews would pray this every day. Every day. It was a ritual, ritual prayer of the people of God. And what we understand in this is that in both Psalms and Deuteronomy, there's a reference to a constant. And the all-time kind of reality 
of walking with God. His word is our sword, it is our bread. With it, we can defend ourselves against every evil word and every evil action. Have you ever wondered what's the defense for all the things that my own brain calls me? Because I know you, like me, probably look in the mirror someday and go, aren't you a piece of work? Apply whatever adjective you need to about yourself. But we look in the mirror and we speak things over ourselves. Other people speak over us. Other people do things to us. What is our defense against such voices, against such inclinations, against such brokenness? It's the word of God. And with the word of God, we are not only nourished and prepared for every good work, but we're guarded in Christ Jesus for his good works that he plans to do through us. So let's ask the question and progress through scripture. What did Jesus say about the word of God? What did Jesus say about scripture? How would Jesus, well, how would he lean in and speak on this? In Luke chapter four, we find this text and we're gonna kind of pair this up every week. We find this text opening up. It says, now Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit and he was compelled or sent by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tested. He had no food and he had, um, he had no food for 40 days and at the end of it, he was very hungry. He was very hungry. And the devil in his hunger, in his desires, I mean, you would really want food by then. You would need food by then. It wouldn't just be a whim, be a desire. The devil comes to Jesus and he says this. If you're the son of God, tell that stone to become bread. Super interesting to note, if you've ever been to the Holy Land, there are big rocks everywhere, everywhere. If Jesus had spoken bread over the stones, there would have been bread for the world. He's saying, get all you want. He said, if you're the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And what did Jesus do? Jesus answered him out of Deuteronomy. He said, it is written. It is written. Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. What is Jesus saying about the word of God there? He's saying it's more important than food. It's more important than anything. He says, we don't live by our food alone. We live by the word of God. Every, ma- every word that proceeds from the mouth of God is life to us. It is purpose to us. Matthew Henry, the commentator, says it this way. It is the rule for our actions and the spring for our comforts. It, the word of God, it guides us where to go and gives us strength and joy on our journey. It doesn't just tell you to go somewhere. It gives you the strength and the joy to live it out. Scripture does. Scripture does. Scripture is the all-sufficient word of God. When we look at John chapter one, it says, in in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. That is speaking of Jesus Christ. But what do we call the Bible? It's the word of God come to life in front of us. It's living, it's active, it matters in the life of the believer. So my question and the application for this is very simple. What does spending time with God look like for you? What does spending time with God look like for you? It should look like something. It should have shape and nuance and context. I wanna invite you to spend time in scripture. As your pastor, there could be no greater joy in my life than to know that you are spending time in the word of God apart from this. Because we know this, there's 168 hours in a week. I teach for about 30 minutes of that, so one over 200, 300 and whatever. An hour out of 168, you're in church. 30 of those minutes are spent in teaching and dealing with the word of God. That's not enough to sustain you. You need to be in the word. What does spending time with God look like for you? What does it look like for you? For me, I am terribly distractible. I think I have ADD, but I'm not sure because I never took the time to figure it out because once I started the test, I did something else. Um, I, I just, I'm not real sure, but it's hard for me. So I'll sit down and read and I'll spend some time reading. And then next thing I know, I'm staring out the window. I'm thinking about camels or like that one scene where like AFV where a camel bit a guy. It was hilarious. I love that kind of stuff. My mind drifts. I'm pretty rough. So I listen, I put earbuds in and I listen to the scriptures. It's really how I learn. I listen, I listen, I listen. I love that. 
And after a while, I get tired of listening. I go back to reading and I have the pace and the patience to do that. It looks like for me having my earbuds in and listening and growing. I don't listen just to other authors. That's not what I do. If you're reading a Christian book, great. It's not scripture. Don't trick yourself. I love my utmost for his highest, the beloved uh, devotional by Oswald Chambers. It's not all scripture. It's one little line of scripture and a bunch from Oswald. I'd rather read scripture. Get into the word of God. Get into the word of God. Is it complex? Yes. Is it hard? Yes. If you have ADD, read the book of Mark. You'll join me in it. It'll be awesome. There's nine scenes in one chapter. It feels like a tornado with words. I love it. If you like something a little richer and something that allows you to kind of see it in a very linear way and a very um, elegant way, read the Gospel of Luke. I mean, Luke was a a physician. He's awesome. He writes it so well. And Luke wrote the addendum of the book of Acts. Read those. Spend time in the Word of God. Don't ask everybody else what they think of it. Spend time and ask God what he thinks of it and what his purpose is for you. But also understand that you... Know God by reading his word. You know God by reading his word. So we're gonna invite you to read his word. We're gonna invite you into a relationship with scripture. We at the church believe in this so firmly, we actually are writing materials. We take the whole text that we're gonna teach on, we write a devotional after the entire text, we write a devotional that allows you to apply it. You can grab them at the entrances or the exits, you can get them online. We invite you twice a week, we put out two devotions a week, spend time doing devotions. The video you saw of uh, the Veenstra family sitting on their couch, of the Nelson family, they're, they're doing devotions together. Spend time in the word of God together. And understand that for you as Christians, there is no replacement for your time in the word of God. So the best way to get rooted is not to get rooted here, but to get rooted in Christ. And to get rooted in Christ, you start with his word. You always turn to the word of God. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your scriptures that come alive and that speak to us, that don't allow us the freedom to excuse sin and to pretend it's not real. But you call us upwards and onwards into you. You don't allow us, God, to be guided by our whims, but you invite us. You invite us, God, to be held close by your word. So I ask, God, that you would give us an appetite for that which maybe we've neglected too long and that we as the church would not spend time just doing the Christian thing, but we would do the thing that matters most in the Christian life. We would be people who eat that book. We would chew and meditate and we would find it being the low growl and hum as we talk to ourselves as we drive, as we spend time early in the morning meditating on what purposes you have and what claims scripture have over our life for your purpose and the growth of your kingdom. Come, Lord Jesus, and bring your church alive by its relationship to the word of God. God, we confess quite often we miss this mark, but today we ask. We ask for you to give us a hunger for that, which we maybe have neglected. We depend on you and we trust you. Draw us to yourself through your word, we pray in Christ's name, amen. Friends, please stand, sing with me. I want you to know something. The invitation to be in the word of God is not rules. This is not something we want from you. This is something we desire for you. Being in the word of God is, the, is one of the benchmarks of the Christian life. It is one of the ways we grow and grow profoundly by the spirit-filled Word of God coming at us through Scripture, speaking the truth of God. So when we say this, I truly mean it. We don't want it from you. We want it for you, to be in the Word of God for your benefit. Today's benediction will be a little bit different um, through this series because I think Eugene Peterson said it so well in Matthew eleven twenty nine 29, and 30. He says this, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you will find your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me, work with me. Come learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything on you that is heavy or ill-fitting. Keep company with me, Jesus says, and you will learn the way to live freely and lightly. 
In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, go with those words spoken over you to live freely, lightly in the unforced rhythms of the grace of God given to you in Christ Jesus. My friends, you are dismissed. Thanks for listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net.